Okay, okay, guys, so this is the Arrhenius equation. A little bit of heavy maths in here, so you might want to do a little bit of research beforehand about natural logs, as I'm not going to go into it too much in this video, so do find out about them first. Either which way, the Arrhenius equation is usually written in this form, k is equal to a and then e to the minus ea over rt. What do these stand for? Well, a is known as the pre-exponent pre factor. This basically just talks to you about how frequent your collisions are. So it's the frequency of collisions in the correct orientation. Okay, so how often things are colliding, collisions per second, things like that kind of thing, or rate of collisions, you could say. This term here, this tells us about, and it's quite a chunky term, we've got the activation energy, we've got the temperature, and we've got the ideal gas constant, which you can find on the back of your data sheet, 8.314. This tells us about the proportion of the particles which have the activation energy, so enough energy to react. So proportion with energy to react. So we've got those two terms there. When you bang them both together, they tell us about k, which is the rate constant. Okay, so the larger k, the faster your rate tends to be, obviously depending on other factors as well. So, um, bang all this together, we get k. What we can do is write this in a slightly different form. So I'm just going to switch these two terms around. The reason I initially wrote it like this is because if you ever look in a textbook, this is how you see it. But I'm just going to pop these the opposite way around. So k is equal to e to the minus e over rt times by a. We're then going to take the natural log of this equation. So again, if you've not looked at logs, look up logs first. Now, the natural log of k is natural log of k. When you do the natural log of e, they cancel out. They're like the opposites of each other. So that would just give me minus ea over rt. And when we do the natural log of a, it becomes plus the natural log of a. These two were originally multiplied. When you do the natural log, they become added. Don't read too much about the maths behind that. If you're not that good at maths, just kind of accept it and deal with it. They become a plus there, and remember that. So what we can do is we can compare this, and again, it's a little bit of maths, to a kind of graphical equation. Y equals mx plus c, okay? Where c is the intercept on the y-axis, and m is the gradient of your graph, if my axis is the y and the x. So here's my y-axis, here's my x-axis. So let's slightly change this equation. I'm going to say ln of k is equal to minus ea over rt, 1 over temperature, plus ln of a. Actually, let's write this in red as well. So the bits in red are my graph axes. I've got my y-axis, log of k, the natural log of k, and I've got my x-axis, 1 over temperature. Now when we compare this to this graphical form equation here, we can see that minus ea over rt is the gradient. So if I was to find the gradient of this graph, that would be equal to minus ea over rt. If I was to find my y-axis intercept, and first of all, if your line doesn't go to the y-axis, extrapolate. So get a ruler, and this is not going to be straight at all, but you would use a ruler and extrapolate it to the y-axis. The point at which your graph passes the y-axis, this is the natural log of A. Okay? And that's pretty much all there is to know about about this equation here and how you can apply it to a graph. There's one extra little thing. Let's say you was finding the natural log of A and you found it to be 25. Then A 
is equal to e to the 25. So just a little bit of extra conversion there. These two are equivalent to each other. It's how natural log and e kind of cancel each other out. So that's how the equation works. Let's think about what factors can affect my equation, though. And in particular, it's the rate constant k we care about. There's three factors I'd like to talk about. The first one is temperature. So if you aren't too good on the explanations for how factors affect the rate of reaction, if you stop this now, and one of Jason's and my students called Sam Lung, it's a Joe Lung, I used to teach his brother called Sam Lung, Joe Lung, he's done a really good video about rates of reaction. So you can pause this, maybe watch that video, get the basics behind you, and that's more kind of year one stuff, and then come back to this video. So welcome back if you left us. Temperature, if you increase the temperature, so upwards R of T, what that's going to mean is your particles have more kinetic energy. So they'll be moving faster and therefore they'll collide more frequently. It's not good enough just to say they collide more. It's not that they necessarily collide more, it's more frequently or at a greater rate or more collisions per second, any of those ideas. I've said an increased frequency of collisions. But that's not the only reason why temperature will affect this equation, or more to the point, will affect K. Because also, if you have a higher temperature, a greater proportion of your particles will have the activation energy. And so therefore, not only will they be colliding more often at a greater rate, but when they do collide, rather than just bounce off each other, they'll have the activation energy to react. So more particles have the activation energy, Therefore, collisions are more successful. Both bits of that are needed in your explanation if you were asked to give one. So we've got particles colliding more frequently, and when they do collide, they're more likely to be able to react because more of them have the activation energy. Therefore, as your temperature increases, K increases, which makes sense. At a higher temperature, you're going to have a faster rate, aren't you? Mostly, just FYI, it is this second factor which causes that. The increased frequency of collisions does matter. It is, a, it is a, a, an effect, but it's a minor effect compared to the fact that more of them have the activation energy. And if you go back to Boltzmann distribution, you can have a think about how that Boltzmann distribution shows that. So again, I've got a video on that you can look up as well. We've also got our term A here. Well, A talks about the frequency of the collisions. So if you increase A, you are increasing the frequency of collisions. And again, if your particles are colliding more frequently, you're going to get more reactions. So as A increases, K increases, which makes sense if you think about it in terms of mass. If you increase that term, that term must also increase. And then very finally, we've got the activation energy, which can also be shown from a Boltzmann distribution. So again, go back and review that if you aren't up on that. Well, as activation energy increases, that means less particles are going to have the activation energy. So when they collide, they're just going to bounce off each other more likely. So as you increase the activation energy, less particles have the activation energy, therefore collisions are less successful, and therefore K will decrease. I always think about temperature and catalysts kind of like this. So imagine you've got a high jumper, and they're trying to get over the barrier. And the height of the barrier represents the activation energy. If your particle, your high jumper, can get over the barrier, that means they've got the activation energy to react. Notice as well the terminology I'm using. I keep on saying particle. Well, why don't I say atom or, or why don't I say molecule? It's because particle is the safe bet. You can describe pretty much anything in chemistry as a particle. It's like a catch-all phrase. Whereas not everything is a molecule. Noble gases don't make molecules. And not everything is an atom. Most things aren't atoms. The noble gases will be. Pretty much everything else will be a molecule. So you can be really careful with your terminology. If you're not sure, just say particle and you can't go wrong. Either which way, if I increase the temperature, that's the equivalent of pumping up my high jumper. 
I'm giving my particles more energy so they're more likely to be able to get over that activation energy barrier and react. If I add a catalyst and therefore lower the activation energy, all I'm doing is lowering the barrier. So again, more particles will be able to get over it and react. So it's the same effect, just via two different routes. Either which way, that's the Arrhenius equation, and that's all really about natural logs, so do make sure you're okay with that.